Okay, so we often get the question, what do you guys do? What does this ministry look like? And so we wanted to share just a little bit of the why, the what, and then the how you can get involved of this ministry just over the next few minutes. So check it out. Before we get into what our ministry is, I wanted to share the why behind our work. So I grew up in Papua New Guinea as a missionary kid um, with Ethnos 360. And from a very young age, I knew a few things. I knew that I loved the people of Papua New Guinea. I was a part of them. I was a part of their culture. And even though I was a little American white girl, like they accepted me and loved me in return. I knew that God created and loved these people more than I ever could. I knew that Jesus loved me so much that he paid my sin debt by dying on the cross. He rose again from the grave and because of that I've been given eternal life and forgiveness and acceptance and all the promises in Christ. I've been given the Holy Spirit and I'm free now to live and to love my God and to know him and make him known throughout the world. I knew that Jesus had died for the New Guinea people just like he had died for me. But unfortunately, many of them would never have a chance to hear of what he's done for them and place their saving faith in him. Romans 10, 15 says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Before Jesus' ascension into heaven, he had his disciples undivided attention, and this is what he said, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Christ gave his life for the lost to be redeemed. He desires that no one should perish and that all be saved. So the question is then, how are we doing uh, as a church? How are we reaching those that we're called to reach? And of the 6,500 people groups in the world, there are still 2,500 to 2,100, depending on where the information is coming from, that are completely still unreached. When I say people groups, I'm referring to the ethne, the, the nations that are referred to in the Great Commission, not the national borders that we know of today, but the nations uh, and the people groups. And so that's broken down into cultures, heritage, it's taught, uh, shared language, it's shared ancestry, uh, a way of life. So what that means is we still have 250 million that live in this context that are still waiting. Uh, they have no access to the Bible, they have no access to a church, and they have zero access to the gospel. And it's the heartbeat behind all of this is why we uh, decided to work with Ethnos 360. So Ethnos 360 started 75 years ago uh, as New Tribes Mission. And really the whole vision behind the organization was to reach the very people we're referring to, the ethne, that are still waiting to hear in the deepest and darkest and the remotest places of the world. Okay, so what does the process look like to reach an unreached people? It's hard, it's not easy. The pro whole process takes anywhere between 10 and 50 years for one people group, but it has to be done. It has to be done right. We have eight steps at Ethnos that we really try and follow. The first is an invitation and to move into the tribe itself. So it actually starts with survey trips to find and then determine the feasibility of working in these locations. We also ask for permission for our missionaries to live amongst them and share God's talk with them. The second step is to learn the language and culture. We call this language and culture acquisition. And it's very, very important. We can't just helicopter the gospel in. Learning the language and learning the culture are both very important pieces. And the only way to do that is to live full time and work full time to learn that language. And that process can take two to five years just to get to a fluency level to where you can then teach and translate the Bible. The third step is to teach the Bible chronologically. We choose to teach the Bible from creation to Christ. As you teach uh, from creation all the way, once you get to Christ, it all clicks. So you have to start from the beginning and go all the way to Christ. The fourth step is something we don't think of very often, and that is most of the time we have to create a written language. 
many of the languages that we're working in don't have a counter part to their oral language and so we have to actually create a written language using phonetics and to actually then be able to translate the Bible into their heart language. So then that leads us to step five which is to actually teach literacy of this new written language that goes along with their oral language. Super important to do so that they can then read the Bibles that will be translated in the near future. The sixth step is discipleship and this is so vital. Now that we have believers, we can't just walk away now. We want to be there to help mentor and disciple into maturity for the believers, for the church to be fully functioning. And that process takes a long time. It's not just going to happen right away. It has to happen naturally and organically as the Bible begins to now penetrate their lives and lead them. We use the book of Acts as the pattern. We don't necessarily just want them to become a church like we know in the West. We're not looking for that. We're just looking for them to be driven by the Lord and to have a community that is faith and Bible based. The seventh step is to now translate the scripture into their heart language so that they can have it, read, and, and understand it for themselves. That process is, again, very hard. It takes a lot of training that our missionaries walk through to be able to accomplish that task and takes a long time. And lastly, step eight is now to encourage them in the Great Commission and to actually go and reach others that they can reach. And it's just another part of the replication process in the Gospel and the Great Commission. So as you can see, we're called to an impossible commission. But it's such a privilege to be a part of it uh, as the church, uh, to do things that only God can do, and we just get to be willing vessels along for the ride. So when you think of this task, you have to realize it takes a large team to accomplish this. It's not just the families that are living in the tribe. One of the ways I think about this is football. When you think of an offense for football, you think of these guys lined up with a football, and their goal is to get it in the end zone. However, most of the time we think of the quarterback, the running back, and some of the wide receivers. Why? Because they are the ones that make the play. They're the ones that get into the end zone and score for the whole team. But the reality is there are many guys that are on that offense that play extremely vital roles. In fact, some of them won't even touch the football during that entire game. But if they weren't doing their job and to a high level, Nobody else would be able to accomplish the goal that they were given, like the running back. He won't have any room to run, and the quarterback won't have any time to throw if those guys on that offensive line are not holding it up. We think of it the same way in our organization. In fact, it takes six people playing what we would say is support roles to keep a missionary full-time in a tribe. And that looks like teachers, and that looks like pilots, and that looks like nurses. That looks like supply buyers. It looks like maintenance. It's all kinds of roles. IT, it takes all kinds of things that allow the family to stay in the tribe full time. If it wasn't for them, they'd be having to come in and out constantly for visas. They'd have to be coming out for medical emergencies. You name it. And they couldn't do that without the, the pilot that brings them in and out. So support roles are extremely vital. I am so proud and I'm so privileged to have parents who spent their lives as missionaries for 30 plus years working to bring the gospel to the people of Papua New Guinea. They played a support role. My dad was the chief aircraft mechanic and would fix the planes that would take missionaries and their kids to the tribal locations. Actually now my parents have transitioned for the last like eight years in government rep work in the capital city in Port Moresby. They work with visas and all the paperwork and. Uh, the passport so all the missionaries can stay in country continuing the work of the gospel. So my family gets to play one of these roles that we love and appreciate have passion for and that is to assist our missionary families and their children. We often call these kids MKs or missionary kids. The truth is it really takes a healthy family to be able to reach these tribes. Though there are many reasons why missionaries leave the field one of the biggest ones is because their children are struggling either on the field or when they are returning to the U.S. There are definitely many advantages and benefits of raising your children in this context, but there are challenges such as culture shock, isolation, 
uh, often feeling misunderstood, loneliness, depression, and even practical struggles like finding a job or understanding the finances in the new culture that they're in. So we as an MK care team want to do everything we can to support this family and this MK uh, as they walk through this whole thing, as their parents continue the ministry and as their children grow up and then go back to the U.S. So we want to invest in these families because they're the ones who have been equipped and really they're the only ones in human history that know this language and know the gospel. And they're an extension of us and we want to invest into them so that they can continue their work there. So that's what we do. We work with the families and the MKs. So what does that actually look like? We have some major elements that we focus on. The first is we look to equip the parents and the MKs. And we look to do that by equipping them for cross-cultural living, for cross-cultural life. We look to equip the parents to help raise their kids in that very unique circumstance and help them prepare them as their kids grow, graduate high school, and then return back to the US, often on their own. That's a hard age to come back. And so we look to help equip them and then we work directly with the MKs as they're going through those transitions. Another element is events. We are pretty event driven. As we work with college age MKs that are back here in the US on their own, we look to do events to help bring them together for different reasons. Some is to help give them some of the transitional tools and, and help equip them with that. It's also to help connect them with other MKs in their area so they have some of, somewhat of a support network with other MKs that are walking through this transition at the same time. We also use events to help us get to know the MK and the MK get to know us so that we are better able and more effective in having the connection point with them to give them the resources that they need and mentorship and coaching. We also do events on the field overseas and that helps to prepare them before they make those transitions, but it also helps to build those relationships so that they, under, they know who we are when they're coming back to the US. We're not just this random team that they've never met or heard of before. Another big element is we, we do member care with our MKs here in the US, and so that's visiting, going to college campuses and hanging out with them, taking them out to have a meal other than the cafeteria food, hosting them during the holidays when their parents are still overseas, and it's also helping them walk through some of these transitional elements that they're trying to process through and giving them an ear and giving them some help through that process. We also develop uh, resources. We help take the fire hose of information that can, can both be hard to find and also hard to find good resources. We help bring that down to a drinking hose so that's easier to consume uh, for our MKs, for our parents to understand the elements that are involved with cross-cultural transitions. Another element is we're a very small team and we have upwards of a thousand MKs just in our, or in our organization. So really we have to partner and network with other organizations so that we can have a better, greater network as they are needing help with their MK in this area. We also have an MK that could be needing some assistance in another area. And lastly, we work to raise awareness in churches uh, that send out their missionaries in support groups, small groups that send out missionaries. Uh, even for the families, we help equip their, their home fronts, so their extended families and, and everyone that's in their circle. Uh, and we help equip them and, and raise awareness of what cross-cultural transition looks like and how that they can help these families. So as you can tell, we really love what we get to do and we're very passionate about it. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what partnership and supporting this ministry looks like. So as Ethnos 360 missionaries, we are actually fully funded through churches and individuals. And that happens as individuals choose to financially support us and stand with us, uh, investing into our ministry. And our ministry then goes to the families and it goes to the MKs, which goes to the tribes. And that's done all to reach the goal of seeing people who have never had a chance to hear the gospel transformed by Jesus. It allows us all to be a part of this great commission effort. This is God's work, and we're privileged to play a part in the bigger picture. God gives us hope in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. 
And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So thank you so much for checking us out. Thank you for watching that and putting the time into it. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to get in, get in contact with us for a partnership, we would love to meet with you in person or over the phone, anything. Um, and then also there's a lot of information on our website, Pete and Bree with an N, Pete and Bree, uh, dot com, and then slash give also has all the partner information. So we also have a Facebook group we can get you connected with. And then every month we send out a emailed newsletter with a video and all that. So we can get you connected in multiple ways. We're just grateful for you. Thanks again for checking in.